do we have for validating the deity of the Holy Spirit? In many cases, we don't necessarily have a problem with the deity of the Father. Uh, in some cases, we have a problem with the deity of Christ, but there's enough evidence to validate that. Is there enough evidence to validate that the Holy Spirit also has the same deity uh, of the Father and the Son? So I want to give you some uh, scriptures and some points that will help you to validate the deity of uh, the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes I don't get the impression that people really realize that when you're dealing with the Holy Spirit or you're talking about the Holy Spirit, that we're dealing with deity. The same deity that the Father and the Son have. There appears to be more respect, more fear, more reverence for the Father, definitely, uh, for the Son, but there is a lack of reverence and respect for the Spirit that we do of the Father and the Son. Because we really don't, in our consciousness, and in many of our churches, emphasize the deity of the Holy Spirit. When you're dealing with the Holy Spirit, when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God. He has all the qualities, characteristics, and attributes of God. So let's uh, see, talk about this. He is God. The Holy Spirit is a person who possesses the divine nature, which makes him to be God. Like his personhood, the deity of the Holy Spirit is also widely denied today. His personhood is denied. People see him as a spirit, a force, a power, but they don't see him as a person. Equally, they do not see him as deity. That he is God is shown by the following biblical facts. The first biblical fact we want to look at is the Holy Spirit is a person who possesses divine nature, which makes him be God, as I just said. Like his personhood, the deity of the Holy Spirit is also widely denied today. That he is God is shown by the following biblical facts. And the first fact is the Holy Spirit has divine names. Say what? Tell me to go Yes. The Holy Spirit has divine names. Okay. We see this, the Apostle Peter referred to the Holy Spirit as being God. Let's go to Acts chapter 5 where we find that. The Apostle Peter referred to the Holy Spirit as being God. He did not refer to him as a force. He did not refer to him as a power. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 says this. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So who did he lie to? And we've talked about that, and we talked about the personhood. You can only lie to a person. Okay? And so, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own, on your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the fact that he lied to the Holy Spirit means he lied to who? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, see how we get that? So the Holy Spirit is God. So to lie is not just lying to people if you are a Christian. Because the Holy Spirit indwells you. It fuels you. It controls you. We make promises. We make vows. We make covenants. We make commitments. We don't keep them. You are not just breaking a promise or breaking a covenant or breaking a commitment. You are lying to the witnesses. And God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are a witness to everything we say and do. Do we get that? Yes. There's nothing we say, I say, or do that the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are not a witness to. And so when we make covenants based on the word of God, we make commitments, we make oaths, we make promises based on the word of God, and we do not keep them. 
whether voluntarily or commanded, then you are lying to the trainer. And the Trinity does not believe in little white lies or <laughs> big lies or medium sized lies. A lie is a lie. Okay. Secondly, the Apostle Paul wrote of him as the Spirit of our God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Spirit of our God. Verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. Anybody who thinks because he calls some brethren in the early part of the book that it's okay for them to sin because their brethren have not read chapter 6. Especially this section. And such were some of you. Some of what? What were some of us? According to the text. So if the text says such were some of you, that means none of you are that now. Contrary to what some churches are accepting, they have not read this text. Because what we were habitually in our practice is supposed to be past tense, not present tense because something happened, okay? And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, just like in Ephesians chapter one, uh, verses three through 14, have different roles. They all have different roles throughout our sanctification, our justification our repositioning from outside of Christ to in Christ and Christ in us. So by those very titles, by those very names, we see the deity of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, under point two, Excuse me. the Lord is the Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter three. A lot of Bible time tonight. Verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Now look, anybody would have known that that title of Lord normally referred to God in the Old Testament. But it's used for the Spirit here in the New Testament. Which means the Spirit must be And so he goes on to say, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror of the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit is responsible for the transforming and conforming of ourselves to Christ day by day until we ultimately are complete in glory. Any questions on that thus far? All right. Number three, his indwelling, his people, whose bodies are called the temple of God, also indicates that he is God. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 16. Jesus talks about this and makes reference to this in the Gospels, when he constantly says that the Father and I will come and make our abode with you. That is a reference to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, he says this. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Here, we're talking about the body, the church, and individuals who make up the church. The spirit indwells us because we now become the resident place of God in a certain sense. 
where God takes up residence by the Holy Spirit in each of us and corporately. There's an individual sense and there's a corporate sense where the Spirit indwells us and we are using, using Old Testament analogy where everybody would understood the temple in the Old Testament is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. But he no longer dwells in temples made with hands. He dwells in his people and among his people. Everybody got that? So whatever you do or don't do, you're not doing it any longer by yourself. There is Trinitarian abiding and abode going on. Okay. So we have this new thing where people don't need, think they need to go to church. But you're indwelt by the Trinitarian presence of God, the Father, God, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you're telling me they don't want to go to church. even though they wrote the scriptures that says you need to go to church, they don't want to go to church because that's the only way you should be coming up with, I don't want to go to church because they don't want to go to church. So you can never tell me nor convince me that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit told you not to go to church. Not when they command you to not forsake the gathering together as some have done. They're not schizophrenic. They don't tell you to do one thing and then they tell you to do some other thing. They contradict the thing they told you to do. Temple people need to go and gather with other temple people. Because there's an individual sense and there's a corporate sense. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 again. Verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body, so it's our body, right? Yeah. Is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were brought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't belong to you anymore. You are under new management. You are under new ownership. You don't belong to the world. You don't belong to Satan. You don't even belong to your husband and wife first, nor your kids. You belong to God. That old song, he paid the cost to be the boss, is absolutely true. Because of the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that he purchased you with. Yet we keep telling him what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. How we're going to act and how we're not going to act. How we're going to respond and how we're not going to respond. Where we're going to go and where we're not going to go. Somebody doesn't understand who's indwelling them because the Holy Spirit is never agreeing with you when you and I disagree with God. And there ought to be some pricking. There ought to be some convicting. There ought to be some nudging. There ought to be something going on that says I'm not comfortable with what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you're acting right now. So I don't believe that we don't know when we out of line with God. Because the Holy Spirit will always prompt you, prick you, convince you, and tell you when you out of line with God. Because he's holy. He can't stand to be out of line with God. And he indwells each and every true believer. So I do not believe people are ignorant when they're off course. I believe we quench and grieve the spirit who is telling us we're off course. 
because we want to stay off course. So we tell him to shut up. We tell him to leave us alone. We tell him to get out of our business. We get busy and preoccupied with stuff so we can't hear him and be sensitive to him anymore. But don't ever tell God you didn't know. Because that's the, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in our life. And he does his role very well. All right. But because we don't know who he is, and we really don't think he's as holy as God, we think we can talk him into compromising or siding with us. Because we spend so much of our life not living under his leadership, we don't know what it is to live under his leadership. If the Holy Spirit was in control of the people of the Corinth, you don't have all these issues that Paul's going to address. Habitually going on unresolved. And that's true for churches today. <clears throat> Because the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit now that he was then. For his identification with the divine personal name, Lord. And these are best seen in the King James Version, so they're in my notes. I don't know if you put them in their notes. Okay, they're in your notes. Jeremiah 31, 34 to 31 to 34, said the Lord, first sentence, you drop down, said the Lord, you drop down to the next sentence, said the Lord, and will be their guide, know the Lord, said the Lord. So the word Lord is attached to the working of the Holy Spirit, and this section of Jeremiah is talking about the new life or the new heart of flesh versus the heart of stone. You and I as believers no longer have a heart of stone, we have a heart of flesh. We have life. And the Holy Spirit brought about that life, nurtures that life, feeds that life, fuels that life, because he's the one that brought the life. And that's why in, in, in Galatians, Paul says, if you have been born by the Spirit, then you ought to walk by the Spirit. If you have new life from the Spirit, then that Spirit ought to be teaching you how to walk out that new life. But we tend to make this a mystery. Yes? So, when you say that No, no. Context has to tell you which one he's talking about. But he's talking about the new birth in an Old Testament context. What God was going to do in removing the heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh. That's really the new birth of John chapter 3. Where Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. But he's also going to do this in Israel, but it also has pertinence to the new birth for Jews and Gentiles. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 and 18 says, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where a remission of these is there is no offering for sin. Judges 15, 14, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax and were burnt with spire, and his bands loosed from off him. This is a reference to Samson. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and enables him and empowers him. Just like the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us in the New Testament and enables us and empowers us. 
but it's, the title is the Spirit of the Lord, which is a reference to the Holy Spirit as we know it in the New Testament. So the Holy Spirit didn't just show up on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is seen in creation throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament because these three are one. And for some people, they think the Holy Spirit doesn't show up until the day of Pentecost. That he would just sit in heaven chilling. But he's involved in creation in Genesis, and he's involved in the whole redemptive story of man by God from Genesis to Revelation. But we miss the title. They're the use of God and use of Jesus Christ when they are used of the, of the Holy Spirit. And with the generic name God, see Matthew 12, 28. Somebody turn to Matthew 12, 28. Somebody else turn to Luke eleven twenty and read that. Read them for us. It's in the King James. But you can read them off your page. You don't have to turn to it because you don't have the King James. It's on your sheet. On your notes. Somebody read Matthew 12, 28 for us. And if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So here's another clue. Why is the word spirit capitalized in that lowercase? Whatever it's capitalized, what do you know? It's referring to what? Deity. When referring to our spirit, it's lowercase. So the spirit of God, so we're talking about the spirit who is God. Everybody with me? How about Luke 11.20? But God with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt, no doubt the kingdom of God is upon you. Okay. Let's keep moving. The Holy Spirit has the attributes of God. The Holy Spirit has the what? What are attributes? Characteristics. What else? Likeness. Nature. Likeness, characteristics, anything else? Grace. Grace. So what are the attributes of God that the Holy Spirit has according to the scriptures? Here we go. Life. How about John 3, 5 through 6? Somebody read that for us, please. John 3, 5 through 6. This is a Bible study. John 3, 5, 6. Mm -hmm. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. All right, you must be born again by what? Spirit. What if I walk down the aisle and say some words, but the Spirit had nothing to do with it? Am I born again? How about if I get dunked in the water and get baptized? Doesn't necessarily say the Spirit had anything to do with it. How do I know the Spirit has something to do with it? Because whatever the Spirit is designed to produce ought to be evident in those where the Spirit has brought about the new birth. But we don't know who a Christian is, and we can't tell who's a Christian and who's not a Christian. Because we refuse to let the Bible speak. Because if the Bible speaks, and I don't do like the Bible, i got to ignore the Bible so my truth can be true. So my experience can be the truth. It's the Spirit that brings life. Just like God gives us life. He gives us life through the Spirit. Just like the Son died so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Eternality. He's eternal. How about Hebrews 9 14? Somebody read that for us, please. How much more should the blood of Christ, which is the eternal spirit, offer himself to that spot to die, cleanse your conscience, and be a person to serve the living God? All right. The Holy
Holy Spirit just didn't show up one day. God didn't make him up just one day. He's always been. Before the foundation of the world, the Holy Spirit was. When God is saying in the Old Testament in Genesis, let us, plural, he's talking about the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because they all have a role in creation. Omnipresent. Omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is like the Father, everywhere present. Like Jesus before his incarnation where he lived himself into a human body everywhere present. You see Old Testament manifestations of Christ before he comes in the incarnation in his virgin birth. Yes. Spirit is everywhere present. There's nowhere you can't go where he is not he is. I know it's not good English, but that's good theology. Where he has not been before you get there. You go to the deep. He was there before you got there. He didn't show up just because you showed up there. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, so I brought the Holy Spirit to the deep. No, he was there before you got there. Wherever. So here's the question. If he's everywhere in presence, do we practice the presence of the Spirit everywhere? That'll change how you behave everywhere. But if you think he's just showing up on Sunday when you're at church, then you can do whatever you want Monday through Saturday. You can hold on to attitudes and behaviors. Because he doesn't show up until you come to church. Because we don't practice the omnipresent, the everywhere present of the Spirit. Or of God. For that matter. Of the Trinity. It will change your behavior, I guarantee you. If you practice the presence. Omnipotence. Omnipotence, meaning he's all powerful, right? You sure he's all powerful? Are you positive he's all powerful? So if he's all powerful and he lives in you, what does that say about you? <laughs> but you have access to one who is all powerful. So I, I heard Charles Stanley just when I we got back on Monday was thinking about this, and he said something that just jumped out at me. You have the omnipotence of God in you because the Holy Spirit who is omnipotent is in you. I look at so again. You have access to all of God's power. Not because you are powerful, but because the spirit that's in you is all powerful. So what can I not do and what can I not stop doing if I have a limited power in me? This is why we fail. We don't fail because we're human. We don't know who we are. Amen. And we don't know what we have. Amen. And we don't tap in and use what we have. So we keep talking like our humanness has more authority than the one who's omnipotent. Now how are you worshiping God with that kind of mentality? You can't be. Because you're saying there is something that is more powerful than the one who's in you. And that's why you keep bowing at that altar 
and then you kind of try to come and buy God's altar, and God says, no deal. Because right. you can't worship two. You can't serve two masters will be loyal to one and hate the other, Jesus said. That's a principle for life. So, we don't think right. And then people who have learned to think right, y'all want to come in and talk to them like they're supposed to think like you think. No, we're supposed to help you to think like you're supposed to think. So you have omnipotence and you have eternality because of the work of the Holy Spirit based on the work of Christ on Calvary Cross. And all this is available to you. Because the powerful one, who is a person, now indwells you and fills you. So I no longer are re I'm relegated to just what I can do or can't do. If I will submit to the one who has all power. My problem is submission. My problem is not ability. I don't even have to have the ability. He has all the ability. Omniscience means what? All knowing? So you don't even have to know everything. You have one who indwells you who knows even the secret things of God. <laughs> he knows the very spirit of God because he is the spirit of God. And where does he live? In your temple. Where does he dwell? In your temple. Where does he reveal himself? In the word. We're going to deal with this when we get to chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. The Spirit knows God intimately, but he reveals it to God's children. So there is nothing that God wants you to know that you don't have access and ability to know. You got the library of eternity available to you. And you don't even have to go to the library, physical library, because he can download it on your heart and mind. Yes. Can we tap into that the characteristic though if we aren't in God's word regularly? Well, he's not just automatically raining right. down in your brain. Right, no, I understand. You must study to show thyself approved. You must rightly divide. You must let the word of God richly dwell and dwell you. Washington Street 16. You got, you got to do your part. See, sanctification has a human part to it. Justification and glorification has no human part. So you can have all this, but if you don't do your part, if you don't work out your part of your salvation in fear and trembling, you have all this, you just may not experience what you have. If I got a million dollars in the bank, but I don't make a withdrawal, what good is having a million dollars? And then I can't pay my bills, and my bills are not being paid, and the debt collectors are calling me, and I'm frustrated because the debt collectors are calling me, but I got a million dollars in the bank, but I just refuse to go. But I'm mad at everybody but the person who won't go make the withdrawal. Yes, sir. access um, to all of the, the, the resource that God makes available to us, uh, but if we don't access it, uh, utilize what we have been given, then we can't tap into the source, because it's, 
because we have a part to play. Yeah. If we don't play our part, we don't get it. And so people get delusional because they can't access. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm going to say we emphasize the point over and over and I've explained it. It's no longer an ability problem. God has supplied everything you need pertaining to life and God is a fact you. It's not an ability problem. We just refuse to tap into or use or learn how to use what's been made available to us. We refuse to trust in what's been available to us. And so humanly speaking, I have weaknesses. But supernaturally speaking, I have abilities that overcome my human weakness. Which one will I focus on? See, that's the problem. Which one will I trust? Yes, humanly speaking, I can be anxious. But supernaturally, I don't have to be anxious for nothing. Which one will I trust? Which one will I tap into? Humanly speaking, I can't do anything that God commands. Supernaturally, I can do all things of God who strengthens me. Which one will I chop into? Which one will I trust? Yes, sir. Um, is, there, is there any relevance to, to, to that in relation to Living by faith or the lack thereof. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is a faith journey. What do you think Hebrews chapter 11 is trying to tell you? How did the Old Testament saints do? How do you think you're going to do it? What happens when they didn't trust God? They didn't do what God said. They couldn't do what God said. But when by faith, by trusting, that's how the Jewish Bible translate the word faith. By trusting so and so did this so and so neglected that for this. But we let our humanity that we've been living under so long who used to be our slave master still tell us what we don't trust. And then we wonder why we fail. Because you're supposed to be out of diamonds and you won't play your trumps. So you're supposed to be out of humanness. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> sin has been stripped. That's yeah, the I'm a player. I'm like, <laughs> sin has been stripped of lending legitimate authority, but you won't play your trump card. You keep asking your partner, pass me over some diamonds so I can play in the suit. No, God says I took away that suit. I stripped that suit because I got something that's got more authority than that suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm trying to work this analogy out. <laughs> and you sitting there looking at it, ain't got no diamond, got a handful of spades and won't play it. <laughs> You got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the only three cards you need. Wow. <laughs> and you won't play. <laughs> because your heart get in the way, your diamonds with your value get in the way, and your clubs get in the way. All right, thank you. Okay. I mean, you have all that. I mean, Christ has trumped everything related to sin. He's done the major work for you. you. You do know none of us could have hung on that cross like Jesus did. None of us were pure enough to hang on the cross to satisfy God's wrath. So Christ did the major work for you and for me. Then he supplies you with everything you need to experience all he has done. But you keep talking in the mindset of what he stripped. Yeah. 
as, a, as if it still has legitimate authority. Because as a man thinking, so easy. This is why you need to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the reason of your mind. So you can prove out what Christ has done on your behalf. So you can walk it out, flesh it out, manifest, let it be manifested. But you can't think the old way. You can't think that the old powers still have their power. You can't think that this world system is what's supposed to tell you and influence you how you think and value and see life. We now see life from a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. Okay. Truthfulness. You've got to tell yourself the truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. What are you going to tell you all the time? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But we don't like truth. We don't really like the Holy Spirit to tell us what he really knows about us. And Lord have mercy, don't be letting the pastors get up there and tell us stuff that only the Holy Spirit is supposed to know. Because I want to know how they know and who told them. As if the Holy Spirit is not with us in the study. If y'all think we study like y'all do, we just read. Y'all can't physically go up to Mount Sinai like Moses and talk with God one on one. What do you think we're doing when we're in the book? My view is always, God, what do you say this means? Holy Spirit, help me to understand what the, because you're the spirit of truth. I don't want to come out of here with lies. I don't want to come out of here with half-baked thoughts. And now what do you want me to say to them based on this truth? But people would rather have a man stand before them and lie to him. So they can leave feeling better than what they really are. Don't be unveiling stuff. Don't be pulling down sheets that I got up and don't be pulling up the shades so everybody can see in. Because Satan be, somebody knows that she's talking about me. And now you no longer listen to the sermon because you're worried about <laughs> who know what. Right. <laughs> this brother was saying there are many schemes. <clears throat> Yeah. Many ways Satan gets us off. Yeah. So he said, just go in a bad mood. You won't hear a thing. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm going to make something happen. going to put you in a bad mood. And your, your ear is going to be turned off when you hit the door. That's the truth. That's how it works. Yes, ma'am. My question is, isn't that the mark of a true shepherd of God? Yes, it is. Because but people don't want true shepherds. Because if you, if God gives you insight, and I tell you every Sunday, usually we have the same conversation, I'd be like, now you know I got to go back and pray to God because you just stepped all over everything <laughs> he's been talking to you. To me, that's the hallmark of a true shepherd. Really, it's very easy. It really is because I'm human just, just like y'all are. Right, so for you to have that insight. So if the Holy Spirit is saying this is you or has been you, mm -hmm. then that means there's some of you, like me, I bet. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So it's not hard to come up with illustrations that are practical because that's filtered through you, and now you know how to relate to your own. But if you're just doing a study to preach a sermon, there's no filtering through your own soul. My son, and this is one of his problems, my son would tell his friends that he used to bring to church when he was younger, I need to tell you this about my dad. It's going to be like he's been in your back pocket rocking around with you all week long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I ain't told him nothing about it. But he knows some stuff. 
he he gets he got he got he, somehow he knows. Well, I don't know. The spirit of God knows. The word of God knows. There is nothing new under the sun. You ain't the first monkey that acted a fool. <laughs> you ain't the first one who disobeyed God. You ain't the first one who got mad at God. You ain't the first one who wanted to turn away from God. You ain't the first one that's struggling with sin. There are people from Genesis and Revelation who've been exactly where you are. And there are people who have failed, and there have been people who have been successful, and we can learn how they failed, and we can learn how they were successful. Yeah. I mean, it's now mystery. He's the spirit of truthfulness. God is the God of truth. His word is truth. Holiness. He's called the Holy Spirit because he's holy. The Son is holy. The Father is holy. They're holy. They're not just holy. The angels say in Revelation, they holy, holy, holy. It is the main characteristic that control all the other attributes of God. See, that's why you can trust that whatever God does is right because his holiness can't do anything else. Whatever he causes, whatever he allows, you have to believe in the holiness of God. You have to believe in the sovereignty of God. He's in control. Even when it doesn't look like, even when it seems like everything's out of whack. Have you read the end of the story? Listen, it doesn't look like God is winning right now. I read the end of the book. He wins. It doesn't look like God is controlling everything right now. Because if God was controlling everything, there wouldn't be so much sin, there wouldn't be so much suffering. Would, and that's what people who don't know God come up with. If there's a God, how come there's so much sin? How come there's so much suffering? How come there's so much pain? How come these people are abusing these kids? How come... If God is controlled, why did he do something? He is. Because if he wasn't, it'd be worse than what you see right now. If he fixed everything, you would have heaven on earth. And this ain't heaven. If he fixed everything, you would never recognize his glory. You would never depend on him. You would never have a need for him if everything went the way you think it should go. He's holy. The Holy Spirit is holy. Romans 1, 4. He's righteousness. The Holy Spirit is righteous. Let's turn to Romans 8, 4. Romans 8, 4. I'm trying to be a good steward of time here. Let's read verse 1. There, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You can't be walking according to the flesh talking about you walking in the Spirit. And you can't be walking in the Spirit talking about you walking in the flesh. We no longer walk according to the flesh. We now walk according to what? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You got a whole new way of walking. Walking means living. You got a whole new lifestyle. You used to have a lifestyle that was characteristic of the flesh. You now have a lifestyle and a way of living that is characteristic of the spirit. And when I'm acting fleshly, the Holy Spirit convicts me, the Word of God convicts me, a brother or sister convicts me, and I turn and walk back, get back to walking in the spirit. So if you have a problem with people holding you accountable, you got a problem with the Spirit, because the Spirit should be the first one to hold you accountable. But sometimes we don't listen to the Spirit, so God sends human beings. 
Sometimes we don't listen to the word and the spirit. God sends human beings. And then when we don't listen to the spirit, the word, and human beings, God says they need discipline. Because if you're going to act like you're not in, God says put them out like they're not in. First Corinthians chapter 5. Matter of fact, turn them over to the devil. And let the devil have his way with them and maybe they'd be right. If they won't get right with the devil having his way with them, I'll just bring them home. Then you die. God will never let one of his children go so far as to embarrass his name and let you keep embarrassing his name and not respond to that. Grace. He's full of grace. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Love. He is the spirit of love. Sovereignty. He is sovereign as God is sovereign. He rules with God. He rules with the Son. The Holy Spirit is sovereign. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. And we're almost done. <clears throat> He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he will. Listen, whatever gift you have, you have because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. You have no right to be envious and jealous of a gift that somebody else had because they didn't have anything to do with giving. But we're envious of other people's ability. The Holy Spirit distributes to each one as he will, and he has distributed to each one. So when you're not using your spiritual gift, you're sinning. You're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit because he gave you a gift, and he is the empower, enabler, and equipper of that gift. So not to use the gift is to be grieving and quenching the Spirit. That's why we don't allow people to join the church and sit soaking sour. Because we don't want a bunch of people sitting there that's grieving and quenching the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be moving and functioning. We can't let you be grieving and quenching. I don't know about your fear. Get active. We'll find it. You ain't going to find it sitting there doing nothing. Try some ministries on. So you find one that looks good and fits. That's what you do with your clothes, don't you? Go shopping all day, trying on all kinds of clothes. Why are you trying on all them clothes? They clothes. You need a pair of pants, a shirt, and a blouse. Why you got to try a bunch of them on? Because you want to find something that looks good and find something that fits. You can't figure that out in the church. You mean I'm supposed to go shopping? Yeah, go shopping until you find your gift and what fits. That's great. Amen. I don't know why I come to this place. No, I really don't practice this stuff before I come. It just, it just, it just, <laughs> We're going to stop there. Try to keep Bob's face short. Any questions?